Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Cash That. This is your host, Joe Delera, and I am joined by producer Corey. This episode is once again brought to you by our good friends at Props.Cash. They are the absolute best in the business in terms of player prop betting. You get those green and red charts. You know exactly where to go. You know exactly where to look. You know how to see that hit rate. Uh, and you know exactly how to fine-tune the data and determine whether or not a play is good or not. Uh, there's plenty of underlying data, the newest tool, the actual line helps you see how the books have adjusted and whether a line is inflated or not compared to other games so if you see in that line and you're trying to figure out it's like why is this game why does this line seem so high or why does this line seem so low you can see exactly how the line has moved in the previous games compared to the current game so that can totally help you figure out exactly where the line was uh you know especially in a past match matchup and how the line has been evolving and those are all critical critical things when you're betting you can get that for 25 percent off your first month with code delara 25 that's at props.cash to get your first month for 25 percent off um guys this is normally we talk about the giants but like my new york knicks this hurt i'm recording we were recording directly after the new york knicks debacle against the Milwaukee Bucks, where the Bucks made as many threes as the Knicks took, wasted the nice 40-piece by Julius Randle. I'm sad, but cheers. That looks good. It's uh, I just finished this, actually, entirely. Not entirely, but, like, that's a lie. But, like, it's, uh, it's, some, <laughs> knob, it's some Knob Creek 12. It's pretty good. 100 proof, though. So it's nice. uh, small... Knob Creek small batch would recommend. I like it. It's a uh, it's a little it's got a little like spice to it. Um, mm. It is good though. You can tell it's like got that like you know it's, it's like a little dark you know. So uh, these glasses are color. from yeah they're they're nice. Dave our our good friend uh our good friend Dave got me these glasses so they're pretty nice there. Um, shout out to last place Dave. Sh yeah, shout out last place Dave. Uh, you know he but stole look, my phone. Is that five years? Is later? he really? That's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, guys, my uh, my one my I have a point zero one percent chance of making the playoffs in my fantasy football league. Apparently, after getting garbage timed back to back weeks, so it's been it's been really rough. But uh, this actually means it might be Lizzie's year. <laughs> so, well, everybody, welcome to Joe's depressed hour. He's just got a lot of things he's got to get off his chest. I'm I'm very sad. I will say though that uh, producer Corey, I, if you guys think he sounds extra crispy, it's because he got a new mic and uh, upgrade, baby. It's pretty nice. So I think it looks yeah, good. No, I can I can guarantee you, no one has spit in this one. No one's been hitting the head with this one. No one's dropped this one from two stories. It's much better. You can tell. Yeah, and you got like the heavy duty wire going into it. Like I got the USB C. You've oh, got dude. like the real. You got the real one. This is uh this is a road dog right here, this wire. This thing's seen some shit. Damn. That's how you know. Shout That's out to the meat know. locker in Montclair. Oh, yeah. dude. The meat locker was the best. <laughs> oh um, no, for... Joe. There's a more dangerous oh, meat there's locker. There's a different meat locker? Oh, so you yeah, gotta tell me about an that. Italian restaurant in uh Montclair. This is just full of gabagool. <laughs> oh no. It's full of um I won't say drug addicts, but definitely alcoholics beating the shit out of each other in the basement. All right. Well, this this is the bathroom. <laughs> the bathroom, like if you cross the threshold into the bathroom, I'm pretty sure you get hepatitis immediately. Love that. There's, place. That honestly sounds like a place that I need to avoid at this stage of my life. But uh, you know. <laughs> shout out to anybody, or any of our listeners who know about the meat locker. Shout out to you. <laughs> that's that's absolutely. I unhinged. hope you made it to the ripe old age of at least 27. It's good. Yeah, it, good it's like you immediately revert back to like prehistoric times where life expectancy was like 25 years old. If you were 31, like oh, yeah. you're there's things you're in just, there that'll kill you young, dude. That is it's honestly kind of crazy when you think about just like how young people were when they used to die, like just because that was just what mm -hmm. it was. Like it's just average age 30 at the like at the end of yeah. your life. That's it. And I mean, it, it kind of goes to show like just how impressive it is that LeBron James is still playing at the ripe age that he is in his 21st season. So it's definitely incredible. We're recording this right now. The Lakers are playing the Suns um, and 
the score right now is I don't know. They're they're showing a LeBron replay, so it's actually uh it's actually been quite oh the Lakers are up forty four to twenty nine. So we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about some Wednesday best bets uh for the slate, but I'm gonna talk about the in season tournament as a whole, and I think it's been an absolute blast. So. Let's get into our best bets for the Wednesday slate first, and then I will turn to uh, I'll turn to the like the remaining kind of semifinal games, what I think is going to happen here, and the finals, and maybe some of the actionable things that you can take from that. So, uh, the first bet that I lo- that I want, and I, the first bet that I locked in was Paolo Bancaro over eighteen and a half points against the Orlando Ma- or against <laughs> against the Cleveland Cavaliers. I also like Joel Embiid over thirty and a half points against the Washington Wizards. I like the Orlando Magic minus four or plus four plus four and a half rather, and I also like the uh, the Brooklyn Nets at plus four against the Atlanta Hawks. So those are all a couple spots that I'm looking at, um, and I also like. Uh, Nikola Jokic over 12 and a half rebounds against the Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, I'll try to touch on all these games or as many of the games as I can, but some of these spots are definitely just, it, it's a huge Wednesday slate. And the way the schedule is this week, it's a little bit crazy. Pretty much every team that's not in the in-season tournament is playing on uh, is playing on Wednesday. And then these teams are also playing on Friday. The only games that are going to be on TV are going on Thursday are going to be the in-season tournament semifinals. And then on Saturday, the whole league will turn its focus to the in-season tournament finals, both of which we're going to be in Vegas. And then Sunday, actually, the league has off. So you can focus on, you know, your football, your stuff like that. Uh, And then the league will kind of get back to normal starting on Monday. Um, the reason I I'll talk about the magic game first. And the big reason why I like this spot for Orlando is I think that they have been a much better team than Cleveland kind of on the season, to be honest with you. Uh, Orlando has been dynamic, even though their offense hasn't been that great, but in terms of their adjusted defensive rating, uh, and their defensive rating as a whole, they're fourth overall. Um, when we look at Cleveland, Cleveland has been better than them, honestly, in terms of adjusted net. They're plus 2.1, which is eighth compared to Orlando. They're plus one, which is 15th. But part of my problem with Cleveland is they they haven't necessarily looked as good. And I don't love some of the things in their shot profile. Um, whereas Orlando, like I really just love what they can do defensively to you. And Cleveland has really, really struggled offensively. Um and I know that Cleveland's defense has also been good, but what, how Cleveland scores is really through their guard play, and that's through Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell. And what Orlando can throw at you between like Suggs, a little bit of Fultz, um, a little bit of Franz Wagner on the perimeter, uh, I love what they're th- they're able to throw at you defensively to kind of keep you on your toes. Whereas what. Orlando has been able to do on the offensive end. It's been like a little bit of a slog, right? But uh, like in terms of like how good they've been offensively. But the thing that I appreciate and that I like is that, you know, you have a lot of young talent. You have that great two man, two man game with Franz Wagner and Paolo Bancaro. And I think that this is a spot where they're going to be able to come out. They've, they've been rested, have a couple days off uh, and kind of come out firing. And I like the matchup in particular for Paolo. And I know that this is, a tough matchup on paper against the Cleveland Cavaliers, but he's really been excellent in this spot against them last season. He scored 20 plus in all three games against the Cavs averaged 23.7 in those head to head matchups. So this line, it opened at 18.5 betted immediately. It's 19 and a half at some books. I think that that's okay. And I would just potentially reduce your risk a little bit. And I want to talk about this idea later and we'll kind of come back to it. Uh, But what I like about this is that, Paolo is so dangerous in this matchup in particular because he has the ability to score at all three levels. And last season, Paolo, not nearly as efficient from three, right? And he still made three, zero, and two threes in these matchups. So the two was a little bit more aligned with what he was doing last year, right? This season, though, he's shooting 44.3% from deep, which is a significant, significant uptick. And that 
increased efficiency is kind of helping his looks overall defenders are having to come out to him they're going to have they have to kind of start spacing out to the perimeter to defend him because that look is so good from him uh and he's a very tough defensive assignment for evan mobley and jared allen he's bigger significantly bigger than mobley in terms of the weight he's probably got about 30 pounds on mobley and then he's a lot faster than jared allen so i think that this is a spot where paolo is going to be a pressure point and the ability, I think that Mobley and Allen are both going to have some difficulty defending him. And I like Palo to go over the 18 and a half points. Uh, and, I, and I'm pretty comfortable taking 19 and a half as well. For the next pick that I liked, I like Joel Embiid over 30 and a half points. This is strictly, strictly matchup based. Um, Philadelphia, they're heading down to Washington, D.C. to take on the Wizards. And Embiid has not played like he's had a ton of extra rest. He hasn't played since Monday, November 27th. So that's a pretty significant window, especially in the NBA at this stage in the season for a guy like Joel Embiid to have that many days off. It's like, it's like, you know, like when you like Corey, I'm sure you've done this before too, but it's like when you have those holiday weekends and then you are able to like sprinkle in like one extra day off and it just extends the thing to like nine days out of nowhere. That's exactly what the Philadelphia 76ers did with Joel Embiid. So I think, you know, like we kind of give Joel Embiid a lot of shit, but like maybe, maybe he is like a working class kind of guy. Um, I respect that hustle. <laughs> so I that's, that's kind of what I was thinking about this, but it's nice. Like he's got a couple extra days off. I think he's going to come out pretty well rested. And uh, the guy is leading the league in scoring with 32 points per game. And he has that like affinity for draw, drawing fouls, obviously, right? And that's been a major factor in his success. So I think his points line is a little bit low here. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that people are concerned, uh, number one, about the absence that he had. And then number two, about the potential for a blowout. But he's over this line in 10 of 16 games this season. And when the Sixers win big, it's he's usually playing a pretty large part in that. Um, and from a matchup perspective, Embiid has just cooked absolutely cooked the Wizards 48 34 and 48 points against the Wizards over the last two seasons and their opposing center Daniel Gafford just cannot stay out of foul trouble had five fouls in their most recent game where Embiid dropped 48 so this is definitely a matchup where Joel Embiid can kind of feast and you know we talk about Embiid a lot and it's just that like when he plays and like when they play these teams that have poor centers or you know like the the defense isn't necessarily as good he just kind of torches them so i i really like the spot for Embiid. i think that this is a point or two low i think this should probably be like 32 and a half or maybe like a juice 31 and a half um and that's kind of where i have this for my final play i like the brooklyn nets uh plus four and a half against the uh against the atlanta hawks Part of why I like this is Atlanta is 12th in adjusted net at plus 1.2. Brooklyn's plus 0 0.8 in adjusted net. Um, the big thing, though, is that Brooklyn's offense has been like surprisingly okay. Uh, and Atlanta can't stop anybody. So this is, I think, going to be a really fun matchup. And what I like here for... Brooklyn as well is I think that Claxton this is a spot where I think Claxton could have like a decent game right he has scored uh, he scored 22 points against Atlanta earlier in the year. Uh, he also grabbed 11 rebounds. His line is at nine and a half rebounds. I'm definitely taking a little bit of a PR play, I think, here. Um, and I also like him. He's at two and a half blocks. I like the two and a half blocks as well. It's a game where he can kind of line up a little bit more against Clint Capella. And he's seeing a lot more minutes in the paint. He's seeing a lot more time, like, you know, on the in the interior, uh, as opposed to maybe roaming as much, just based on what Atlanta's personnel is. He's a lot faster than Capella. Um, so he's able to kind of get into his spot, like get those lobs, get those oops for him to score. And then he's also able to kind of grab a couple and like sneak some of those rebounds as well. So I do like the spot for him against Clint Capella here. Uh, Capella has also rebounded exceptionally well in this matchup. So he's had 15 rebounds last time out. So if you wanted to get a little bit funky, you could always do a little bit of a double-double parlay between Claxton and Capella. Don't hate it. I think it could be a little bit fun. Um, and it's definitely it's definitely a cool opportunity here. Um, additionally, when we're looking at you know who you can kind of throw on some of these guys for Atlanta, the big thing with Atlanta is they lost Jalen Johnson. Jalen Johnson's still dealing with that ankle injury. Um He's a big loss for them, 
Uh, it means you're going to be seeing a little bit more Sadiq Bay, a little bit more DeAndre Hunter. Um, and neither of those guys are as like explosive as Jalen Johnson was. So I think that that helps this Brooklyn team uh, whose defense has, you know, struggled like a little bit this year, but they do have good defenders, but it like, makes it a little bit more stationary for them. It makes it a little bit more like you can anticipate exactly what they're going to do on a little bit more of a regular basis. So I think the line is just a little bit too long and I'll take Brooklyn. Uh, I'll grab the points with Brooklyn in the spot. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple things. Number one, Chris Paul looks like he's going to be returning. So that Steph Curry assist prop that we had kind of been looking at, uh, you probably have to probably have to leave that one by the wayside for now uh, and just kind of stash it in the background to kind of remember what exactly is going on. Right. Uh, and then for, oh, I almost forgot for the, the Nuggets Clippers game, Denver has moved to, it's weird. They opened at minus one and they moved to plus one. Um, I think in part, maybe because there's still a little bit of uncertainty in their injury report with um, Jamal Murray and Aaron Gordon, both, you know, having their status a little bit in question. Uh, it's, it's a little bit un like, it's a little bit uncertain exactly what their, what their status is going to be for this game at this point in time. Uh, he's questionable. Uh, Gordon is probable. So we'll, we'll just have to see exactly what happens. But the fact that they're both, especially Gordon is still popping on the report is definitely notable. Um, I do like Jokic to get the 12 and a half rebounds though. It's a spot where he has crushed against the Clippers uh, in his last four. He's got 13, six, which is like a weird outlier, 17 and 16, the 16s from earlier this season. Uh, he, he just really kind of torches uh, zoo. So I do like the 12 and a half rebounds. You can get it at a plus one Oh five. I think it's a good spot. Um, it's, it's obviously feels like a high line, right? Uh, but I do think that, given the given the circumstance this is a line he can definitely he can definitely go over here at 16 and a half um and on the same note for zoo he is needed on the floor um and he grabbed 13 and 14 rebounds in the last two games that he's played against denver so uh i do or i do really like the spot for him uh just as a fact that he just kind of needs to be on the floor so obviously tice has kind of cut into those minutes a bit but zoo is like a slightly better matchup for 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 Jokic uh, you know kind of at this stage of the at their careers especially but also from a size and physicality perspective so two things that I wanted to talk about uh a little bit more generally before getting into the in-season tournament are one thing that people talk to me about and they're like joe when you post a play like can you say you know like what you might take this to or what the like what the line would be that you would take it to a lot of what i do you know like i i'm not a modeler like that's not how i that's not how i bet um that's not how i look at things it's just it's just not something that i do right so it's a little bit harder for me to say like all right well take it to take it to this or like i think it's okay to hear um, the big thing that I try to do and I think is relevant for you is obviously like when, if I give it a play at minus 110, I need it to hit, uh, over 52.4% of the time in order to be profitable. Um, when I, and I think that the thing is that you always need to remember is with implied odds, uh, and with money lines, there's always an implied probability associated with that. So when I bet at something at minus 110 is 52.4%, um, that's a little bit different than like if it's minus 150 and 60 percent am i saying that like i think this play is like do i like it more because it's more juice not necessarily um i just think that sometimes like i'll look at the hit rate or i'll look at the matchup and i'll say like i think that this is still worth a play um so if you were like just for one example right like if you were looking at a play that's hit in three out of four games, or let's say 75% of the season. Uh, let's use like a bigger sample size, because I think smaller sample sizes can sometimes get a little bit noisier depending on the circumstance. So if you were betting on something that has happened 75% of the time, uh, and you think that, you know, this is another circumstance where it's like, okay, well, like this should happen. It, it should still continue to happen 75% of the time. In theory, you should be able to bet 
a minus 300 money line and it would be equal value in terms of what the implied probability is, right? So you would have, you could either lay three, you could basically lay $300 to win a hundred or bet a hundred to win, I guess it's like $33, right? I know nobody wants to do that. Like nobody wants to bet on juice like that, but when I like, and I think, and I think that's important, right? So like there are certain plays, like I'll look at it and be like, yeah, like that, that should hit like the odds, the odds like make sense. But I'm like, I don't want to bet it. You guys don't want to bet it. I don't think a lot of times it's worth taking that risk. Even still if I want to have fun. Yeah. Like we still want to have some fun here. <laughs> like, so I think that, you know, those are some things to consider, right? If when I bet, I try to bet in a way where I don't think that the margins necessarily always like matter as much right like i'm not betting on something usually because i think that there's like a five percent edge like and i and this is something that i think a lot of people uh do differently it's something i've had a conversation with numerous people about i think the only person that's like really close to the way that i see it um is brandon anderson uh the way that I like to look at it in the way that I bet is like, if I think something's going to happen, I usually think it's going to happen by like not a wide margin, like, or by, by a significant margin, right? Like I like to bet on things that have like upside. Like I don't like to bet on things that have, um, upside or downside. Right. I don't like to bet on things where I'm like, well, like the margins thin. So, let's to put that into perspective like let's say i was betting on a points prop like i was looking at eric gordon's in this game uh with the suns and the lakers right and his points prop was at um his points prop was at 12 and a half so right now he's at two points uh and we're almost at halftime part of why i didn't like the bet was that the margins for him were so thin like there were a lot of games where he was finishing at 13 um and the hit rate when you actually had Booker and Durant, like wasn't nearly as good anyway. Uh, but there were a lot of games that he was finishing at 13. So when I'm like looking at this and when I'm like capping it, I'm saying, okay, well, the like the delta and like the margin is not significant. So like I'm betting on him, if I want to bet on him to go over this line, because I like the matchup against the Lakers, uh, but like I was like I was uncomfortable with the line because when I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, if I'm betting on an over, I'm basically saying like he's got to get like the 13 and he's really like getting the 13. Like that's like the that's the bar. Like that's pretty much where he's going, because when Booker and Durant played, he like wasn't really dropping like 20 plus or anything like that. So it made it much more of a narrow margin. Right. So those are some things that I want to consider when I'm like betting on a prop. Additionally, like if I bet on something is minus 110, 52.4% is what I need. That's for my break even. If you're betting on it and it moved to like minus 150, that's 60%. That That's your break even point is at 60%. So I think that those are all like that's a notable thing too. Um, the difference is doesn't feel significant, but like it, it matters in terms of like your immediate output. Uh, right, like what you have to pay to win that amount back, and you know what the percentages are between the two of them, right? And especially, but especially over the long term, that's going to change it. So, a lot of times, like I'll like a play, and like you'll be able to tell it's like okay, like he bet this, um, like Joe bet this, like you know he's still putting it out there, like he still likes it, obviously. So it's like even if it moved, I think that the way that I look at it, especially is like, if I'm laddering it, number one, then you should still feel comfortable betting it because I like the alts like up higher. But a lot of times, like when I'm betting on something, like I'm not looking at it saying like, all right, well, it's minus 110. I have this happening like 57, 58% of the time. And then the line moves. And then like, you know, now it's minus 150. So it's saying 60% of the time, like I'm trying to not get there. I'm trying to look at it from like a probability perspective of like the way I'm capping the matchup. Like it's not strictly based on hit rate. It's based on a variety of different factors. Like what I think the matchup is, uh, what I think the game flow is going to be, what I think the performance is going to be, how I think this player matches up in this particular scheme. Like what shots is this, is this team giving up? That type of thing. So like sometimes I'm wrong. Like this just, it's what happens. Um, but other time, but the way that I try to bet is I try to not bet on things that have like thin margins. And it's weird because it's not, 
intuitive. It's not like, or it is intuitive. It's not really an easy way to model. Um, cause there really isn't necessarily a model for that. Uh, it's just the way that I'm looking at things from a matchup perspective that like get kind of gives me the reasoning for, you know, why I'm putting something out there or, or, you know, or so to speak, I hope that was coherent. Uh, <laughs> so the, the other thing was when I bet, and I think that this is probably the more important thing. When I bet, I flat bet. And I've talked about this concept before, but when I put out a play, I bet one unit on it almost every time. Sometimes you'll see me bet to win. And it's usually like, cause I like the play a little bit more. So I'll like risk a little bit more. Um, but I'm not usually bet doing that. I'm very rarely doing that. I'm almost always betting one unit and then I'll win whatever I win based on the odds. Like if it's plus 200, if it's plus 150, if it's minus 200, like I'm betting the one unit. And the reason I do this is I think it's super important for bankroll management purposes. Because when I see it, when you are betting to win, right, as opposed to flat betting, if you like, if there's a play that's minus 300 and you put three units on that play, then you it's not even about the implied probability anymore. You like that play three times as much as a play that's plus 100. That's the way that I see it. And I think that that's unlikely, right? So, and if you do like it that much, then it should be a multi-unit play, but it doesn't need to be, right? So like, just because if something's listed at minus 300, 75% implied probability. I think this happens 90% of the time when I look at the numbers. That doesn't mean that... And I bet it. So I might bet one unit on it. If I like another play that's plus 100, and I like it just as much as that play that's minus 300, like why would I change... Like Why would the risk amount be different for the two plays besides you're trying to win... You're trying to win a little bit more, but like I think from a risk perspective, you're you're risking too much on the minus three hundred play because it's like disproportionately weighted on your bankroll. Uh, I don't try to think of things in terms of like what I'm winning. I try to think about things in terms of what I'm putting out there, at least on like a bet to bet basis. So I think that that's important for your bankroll management. Um, finally. The other topic that I wanted to touch on was the Joel Embiid thing with like blowouts. And I always get frustrated with this because I'm like, well, if it, if you think it's going to be a blowout, like who, like who's scoring? Like somebody has to score. Like something has to happen here, especially with points props. Like those are the ones that I think, and I think even with assists and rebounds, right? Because like you're passing to somebody, like somebody has to score. Somebody's going to miss shots if it's a blowout. So I think that those are all things that like are captured usually within the line. And I, I don't want to address the fact that like, yeah, like sure. Like it could be a blowout. Like any game could be a blowout. Um, some games might have more blowout potential than others. And, but I think a lot of times it's cooked into the line and then people are like, Oh, like maybe I should avoid it. Maybe I should put it under like whatever. And I'm like, well, how do you think they got to the point where they're blowing this team out? It's probably because somebody's scoring a lot. And it's usually going to be this guy like Joel Embiid in this instance where you can look and say like, all right, well, like how do they win? How does he perform in wins of like 10 or 15 or whatever? And you can kind of see, but those games are hard to tell too, because teams like, you know, you could be missing some data or like some important points. It's like, well, did they blow them out? Like at the very end of the game, they blow them out early in the game. Um, and like, did they, did the team make a late run with like the bench unit, but they were never going to catch them. Those are all types of questions that you can see, but it's harder to find just from the data. Uh, like at least it's readily available. You could find it. You just would have to dig for it a little bit more. So blowout potential, I think is something that's just inherent in the game. Uh, but I think it's cooked in the line a lot of times. And a big thing is just, just I'm like, well, somebody's got to fucking score. So it, it just is what it is. Um, in season tournament though, right now we know that the new Orleans Pelicans advanced in the West to the semifinals. We know that the Milwaukee bucks are going to be playing the Indiana Pacers. Sad day, sad day for my New York Knicks. But 
I wanted to hang it Gross. in the rafters. I wanted to hang it in the rafters. Um, this game between the Bucks <laughs> and the Pacers is literally the most obscene. It's just an obscene total. The total opened at 249 and a half. It's already been bet up to 254.5, which is just an insane number. Uh, they already actually opened a couple props. Tyrese Halliburton's at 28 and a half points. Giannis is at 32 and a half. Giannis is at 11 and a half rebounds. And and Giannis is at five and a half assists. Uh, I might look at that assist line. I think that one's definitely interesting. Um, but that's all we have so far. Um, I <laughs> look when these two teams played earlier in the season, they scored the Bucks. the The Pacers actually won, but the Bucks were favored by one without Damian Lillard. The Pacers won one twenty six to one twenty four. Giannis dropped fifty four points, <laughs> and then um, Halliburton had 29 6 and 10 Halliburton I want to I want to die the fact that Halliburton had his first career triple double and I didn't bet it uh, like I'm sick I could be sick thinking about it um will he do it again entirely possible entirely possible um what I will say though is that this game is going to just be played at an absolute lightning pace and I just don't see a circumstance where the I, I just don't see a circumstance where there's not a million points scored. Um, the Pacers literally have the number one offense in the league and the number 30th, the 30th ranked, so the last placed defense in the league. The Bucks also have an abysmal defense and an electric offense. So this game is kind of shaping up to go that way. The one thing that I will note, this is actually very similar to what just happened in the New York game, right? When the Pacers beat the Bucks. The Pacers were 20 of 48 from three, 41.7%. The Bucks were 9 of 27, 33.3%. So I think that that number will definitely regulate to a certain degree. Like, I think that the Bucks will probably take some more. Like, we just saw them make 23 threes against the New York Knicks. The one thing, though, is the Pacers do a very good job of limiting three-point opportunities. So it could actually make this to be like a little bit tougher of a game for Milwaukee just based on the fact that the matchup is a little bit tougher. Um, I think that Indiana's really there. The way that they can win is to just absolutely run the floor. Um, that's their only, that's really their only opportunity is just run, 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 run. And it's going to create a pressure point, obviously for Milwaukee, but the Bucks play the, the Pacers play at the fastest pace in the league. The Bucks play at the fifth fastest play pace in the league. This is just going to be an absolute blitzkrieg in terms of the offense. So I think obviously points overs are going to look good. I'm curious to see what Halliburton's assist line comes out at. Uh, the thing that was interesting in this game was that Halliburton actually only had 10 assists in a game where the Pacers scored 126 points. Bruce Brown had a lot of assists. He had, his stat line was 11, 9, and 7. So I do think that this is going to be an interesting game. We'll obviously get to dive into it a little bit more, but my gut would tell me that especially as a guy that's sitting on a Tyrese Halliburton ticket though. Uh, I have a 71 tournament MV, 72 one tournament MVP ticket on him that this is probably a game where you, like, I would, I honestly like I'd like to bet the Pacers, but I'm just not going to really add to the position. I do think that the addition of Damian Lillard makes this a little bit more interesting. Um, you know, obviously you add Dame into any lineup and you're going to be dynamic, right? Uh, but I do think that this is going to be a very tough game for Indiana. M Chris Middleton, I think, will play some more minutes. Uh, he only he was limited to 20 in that game. The biggest thing, too, is, you know, when we look at this game against the, the Knicks, uh, Chris Middleton played 26 minutes. So that's a bit of an uptick. You can tell that these games are like meaningful. I think that honestly, Dame, Giannis, and Brooke all would have played a couple more had this game been a little bit tighter down the stretch. Um, 
because they were playing with that like type of playoff level intensity. Giannis 35, 8, and 10 assists. Dame with 7 assists. I think that this 5.5 assist line might just be way too low for Giannis. Uh, I know that he only had 3 against them previously in this game against the Pacers, but I think that when you add Damian Lillard back into the fold, it definitely makes this a much more difficult game, or it makes it a much more difficult uh task to defend both of them and i think that could open up some more assist opportunities for Giannis, who has really thrived with the assists th- playing next to dame uh when we look at the pelicans against either of the suns or the lakers it's a little bit tougher obviously to cap right i think the pelicans have a pretty good matchup against both of them especially with trey murphy returning Trey Murphy's been awesome four threes in his debut three threes in his most recent game against the Kings the dude can just shoot his length his athleticism is really making a hell of a difference uh I do think that there is a little bit of a buy window on Zion Williamson to be the tournament MVP um I do kind of like the matchup against both Phoenix and the Lakers. Uh, those are both teams that uh, Zion has kind of kind of played pretty well against in the past uh and the number, I think, is just wrong because they, they've moved Brandon Ingram to be the favorite overall uh, in the in-season tournament MVP odds. Part of that has to do with the fact that uh, the, the, the Bucks hadn't played yet, um, but the number just got... He was the one that got his odds shortened by a lot, but the matchup against the Kings really set up well for Brandon Ingram. For Zion, he's averaged in three games versus Anthony Davis, 25.7 points, 7.7 rebounds, 4.7 assists. This is a great spot for him, I think. Uh, I think we'll probably see a line maybe like 23 and a half, 24 and a half, uh, just on the expectation that this is, you would think this is a tougher spot. The thing is, Zion's just a dyna- he's just a force. And those are kind of the players that AD struggles with a little bit. Uh, you could see AD, I could see AD maybe playing a little bit more minutes on Jonas Valanciunas and, uh, you know, kind of focusing there. So I, I do like the matchup for Zion. I think that instead of maybe betting his props, I think that there's a better, the better angle is to maybe bet on him to win tournament MVP because if he plays well, um, I think that the odds are going to narrow significantly between him and Brandon Ingram, uh, because I think this is a tougher matchup for Ingram with, you know, probably being guarded by, you know, like a little bit more LeBron. Um, I I think it's just a tougher spot for him. And I, I think that with, at this stage, new Orleans has so many different people that they can kind of throw. Like there are so many different players that can have a big game that the odds shouldn't have shortened in the way that they did for Brandon Ingram. I understand that he did have the one big game, but I think that it's going to be tougher for him to have multiple big games, uh, you know, moving forward through this tournament, uh, if they are able to do so. From a Lakers or Suns perspective, uh, the Lakers are winning right now 57 to 45. Um, or no, is that is that live? No, it's not live. It's halftime. Um The Lakers are winning 59 to 47 at halftime. If this holds, you're going to see the Lakers play. You're going to see the Lakers play the Pelicans. Um, This is a spot where the Lakers, I don't know if I trust them in the spot, in part because New Orleans has so much size with depending on the the lineups that they run out, right? Uh, Like you can run a lineup with like Herb Jones. Uh, Trey Murphy, Zion, Jonas Valanciunas, Brandon Ingram. Like, that's a big lineup. And I think that that might be a little bit of a tougher task for the Lakers to defend, Um, especially on the perimeter with, you know, like D'Angelo Russell, Torian Prince, Austin Reeves. Like, it's, it's a little bit tougher of an ask, especially when the Pelicans perimeter defenders are so strong. And that's like, you know, you can obviously add it. CJ McCollum is not a good defender, but Jose Alvarado, excellent defender. So those are all kind of spots that I think are going to be tougher for the Lakers. And then guys like Jonas Valanciunas kind of has the size uh, to deal with a guy like Anthony Davis on the interior. So I think that those are all slightly tougher matchups. Um, I think the Lakers would be favored probably. And it's probably another spot where I would want to bet on the, where I'd want to bet on the Pelicans uh, overall over the course of the season. Um, 
The Pelicans are plus 1.1 in adjusted net rating. The Lakers are minus 0.2. And the Pelicans, as I've kind of been mentioning, are only continuing to get more and more healthy. So I think that it's a good spot. But it's also one of those things like, do I want to bet against LeBron? Like, not really. But it just, that's that's kind of the way it's shaping up. But I think that we'll we'll kind of see how these games shake out. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into them a little bit more. And then uh, I will be covering more of these games. And I'll be covering the final for Action Network on Saturday. Um, but those are my thoughts on the in-season tournament. I think it's been a lot of fun. I think that we've seen a little bit of a playoff atmosphere in terms of the intensity. Uh, and I think that these games might like tighten up a little bit. I think maybe we'll see some slightly different rotations, but it doesn't seem that way. It seems like the teams are just playing them as like enhanced regular season games. But with the move to Vegas, with that like real feel, that real environment setting in, I definitely could see this turning into a little bit more of a slugfest. Um, so with that, producer Corey, how you doing? I'm um, feeling good, Joe. We're almost done with the second period. Feeling good. Devil's Road dogs right now. I know you uh, live bet them. Kicking the shit. Yeah, I did. Um, they are making me sweat it out, though. God forbid I get to go to bed early. <laughs> No, you can never go to bed early. That's just the way it is. Nope. Um, but at least you're moving into your new place. So it's definitely, you know, it's a nicer, nicer scenario out here. I'll take the dub somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You got to take it somewhere. Um, producer Corey, tell us how, tell us what we need to, tell us what you need to recommend for us this week. I mean, it's been a, it's been a busy week. It's the holiday season now. So what do, what do you got it for us? It is the holiday season, Joe. So I have. And I brought some Pillsbury Holiday Cookies. Oh, this guy gets it. They are selling so fast. I took the last three at Stop and Shop. The last three boxes. Had to get them. Only had reindeer and snowmen left. No Christmas tree cookies. You see them? Snag them. You're going to need them eventually. You're going to a party. You're doing something even before the holidays. Everybody loves the guy who brings the Pillsbury Cookies. Just get the cookies, stock up, be the be the hero, dude. That was, I'm not gonna lie, that was a dynamite suggestion. <laughs> that was that was great, that was great. And I, I think like six. I'm zooted dude, I, off sugar right now. Well, the thing about those cookies too is like they take no effort. You know exactly they oh, they're God. consistent. They're so consistent, but like everybody max loves 18 them. Eighteen total minutes to make it, and that includes preheat time. That's what I'm saying. It's it's a joke. It's an absolute joke. I love it. That is that is an absolutely perfect suggestion. Um, I am going to recommend uh, a couple things, but first, I'm going to recommend um, I'm going to recommend using a crock pot to heat up your hot chocolate. So we uh, we had a Joe's our, annual crock pot. Yeah, we had our we had our gender reveal party. So would recommend having a boy because I think it's a lot cooler right now. So I'm stoked Congrats. about that. Congrats. Thanks, Thanks dude. Thanks. Be cooler if it was a boy. <laughs> Be cooler. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's sick. Uh, but uh, it was funny because me and my wife went to Target. And because um, what else do you do when you're just married anticipating a child? Uh, and we're looking at, she was like, we got to look at baby clothes. Now that we know. So we're looking. She's like, I'm lost here. And I was like, this is great. So I can't wait. The, I showed her. I told her the thing that I want to buy. And I was like, I need, I can't wait to buy it. I'm going to buy like a onesie for the kid. Like the Dragon Ball Z. Like the Saiyan. <laughs> like the Saiyan armor. <laughs> and like the Goku. <laughs> Hell yeah. I was like, that's going to be so like. She's, I was like, I can't oh, do that, that if takes it's a me girl. Back. I was like, couldn't do that if it was a girl. So <laughs> I'm very Doesn't excited for that. Same. Yeah, no, it doesn't hit the same. I, and I was like, I'm not trying to have, I can't have a Bulma. That'd be crazy. So, you know, here we are. So here we are. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a deep cut for the guys over here. Um, but the crock pot, anyway, if you take, like, you can take the real Hershey kisses and, you know, with the milk and then you put it in the crock pot, keeps it warm the whole time that you're having the party. So you have nice hot chocolate. Um, it's fucking it's, guy. You know, it's it's a great use of the crock pot. It's just another use of a crock pot. If you honestly, honestly, if you don't have a crock pot, it's insane. Crock you pot a book, are, Joe. Dude, I could I have a recipe book. I you have dropped can. no less than fifteen recipes uh, <laughs> since I've been recording you. Give picks. 
So yeah. like we're like halfway through a book. I'm sure you could come up with 30 total. Joe's crock locks, you know? Yes. Um, perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. uh that's copyrighted. Um it's actually a work in progress. So if you try to steal that, Martha Stewart, we're gonna sue your ass. Yeah, we will. We will absolutely sue your ass, and we're lawyers, so we can do it. Yeah. Um, and we'll go you can go back to jail. Um <laughs> back. <laughs> we know how to do nah, that. That's, too. that's like way too good PR. She can't. <laughs> Yeah, we know how to do that too. We'll end um, up losing the case somehow. <laughs> no, but crockpots are bezzling again. She's hard as fuck. It's like what the fuck. <laughs> so I do think, but no, crockpots are great. You can just leave for the day. Like it's it, it's cooked, it's warm, it's whatever. Like it shreds everything. You can make soup if you want to. Like there's just so many options. So many options for crock. Crockpots are also cheap as shit. They're like fifteen dollars. It's unbelievable. That is the best part. I was at Best Buy today picking up a TV for my brother. Yeah, and literally a wall of Roombas and crockpots. Yeah, and the crockpots are unbelievable. substantially less money. Oh, oh yeah, and honestly, like it's one of those things. Like I didn't know a crockpot was so cheap until I didn't know they sold them at Best Buy. Best Buy sells some weird stuff, man. I like. I knew they had like you know refrigerators and shit, but it's usually the smart stuff. Regular yeah. ass crockpot. Nothing yeah, smart like, about it. Regular do, buttons. Do, there's like there's mine has a knob. It doesn't even have a button. I like so, knobs. Yeah. I'm a Not, tactile a good, guy. I like knobs. Nothing like a good knob, you know? Mm. <laughs> Boss. Q36 Mafia. <laughs> um, so I'm going to recommend that. I'm going to recommend Crock-Pots. And um, I'm also going to recommend... Uh, I'm going to recommend... Oof, man, this is tough. I, I got a couple in the I got a couple in the chamber. I was gonna say I recommend going to a tailor or like finding a good tailor in your area because uh, I just moved and I am appreciating how hard it was. I also needed like a new barber, and I don't. Oh, I, like, I'm have, ter- I, have I have we discussed the barber relationship on this show before? No, but I'm terrified of getting a new. It's barber. like it's it's a bond that is like semi close to what your drug dealer would be like, like. Someone's got to introduce you guys at first. You got to like, you know, proceed with caution. Don't come out of the gate too strong. And yeah. you got to be loyal. Like the second they know you went somewhere else, they might not tell you, but they know. You can never go back. You can, but they're going to know. Yeah. I did not do this to your head the last time you were here. I'm a little pissed. I'm probably going to just, you know, sh- sh- go real easy on you and just get you out of here faster and charge you full price. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's like going back to your former drug dealer, and then they give you snickle fritz, and you're like, "What the fuck?" And you're like, "Well, he ne- he kind of knows that like, I just decided not to go to him anymore." Yeah, like it's and crazy, by that I like, mean um, weed dispensary and the relationship you have with those legal entities. Yeah, like it's it'd be crazy. Like imagine just getting a ton of shake, uh, like yeah. all at once. You'd be like, "What is this?" It's unbelievable. So that's um, what the haircut like, from your former barber is when you go back to him. It's the same yeah. thing. It's like the only shake I'm trying to have is a handshake, you know? So that's it. Yeah. That's it. Um, I that's will tough, say dude. that's it's a it's a rough one. So like I don't know what to do, and I'm like a little bit too I'm definitely too far. Like I could go there if I needed to, but I don't really want to drive that far to get a haircut. It's just it's just not worth it. So it. um if anybody has any if anybody has any haircut suggestions and that knows where I live, please please advise. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> uh, I think um, we should also take this time to um, just tell James Dolan to go fuck himself. And MSG is the worst network on oh, yeah. planet Earth. By far. By my far. stream has collapsed, uh, needing me to log out and log back into my MSG account to watch the Devils play in Vancouver right now. It's almost not worth the trouble. But Dude. It, I, I, you know, I have like a bit of an obsessive problem and I need to watch, so... I keep doing it, but I'm getting angrier every time, and I screw up typing because I'm so angry. And it's just, it's it's the same bullshit. It's really I, ridiculous. I fully understand, man. It's just, it's it's a shame out there. I was and honestly hoping local that... games. Like, come on, are you kidding yeah. me? I pay for ESPN Plus. ESPN have some balls and own the games. Don't let anybody black you out. I was hoping that I moved far enough away that I was going to be in the Philadelphia sports network realm. So that way I could just too get, far, man. I know, man, I'm so bummed. I was really hoping that I could get like through MLB TV and through, um, through league pass that I could just watch the Knicks for free and the Yankees for free. But Nope. I got to That's so hard. Like if we lived in other States and we're fans of these teams, we'd have no problem watching them. 
Yeah, like our one friend Terry is a fan of the Atlanta Braves. Just has a wonderful time watching the Braves. Never it's has like an issue. Every never game has a he wants to see, it's available. Yeah, my Miami Dolphins can watch them all the time. It's unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. So and these like instead, late night road games, like I have to go on a hunt. I'm like, shit, is it on MSG or does ESPN have the rights to this one? Because sometimes you know it's a prime time game yeah. and we move it to uh, one of the local like you know conglomerates, fucking ABC or. It's an, it's so annoying. I have a better handle on NHL playoffs, but like regular season midweek games that are late, it's tough. I fucking hate at MSG, dude. I hate MSG so much. So it's an anti recommendation here. Um, yeah. If you have the chance to piss on an MSG logo, do it, and then take a picture and tweet it at Joe. Yeah, and then tweet it at Dolan too. So yeah, 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 perfect. definitely. We'll we'll it'll compile them so that he yeah. sees them. We'll get our message across. It, it, it will be while hurt. I continue to pay him money for the services that I use. Exactly, like I'm. It's fine. Whatever. It's not the point. Is um, he still in a band? What's that? What happened there? I think he's still in that. We should band. go heckle the shit out of them. I think we'd probably somehow get banned using the facial facial recognition software that they use, and we'd never be able to go into MSG again. I'll just wear a mask and be like, "Yeah, I'm sick." Oh yeah, true. That is that is the new thing now. Um, I guess you know. Yeah, people just get regular sick now. So here we are. Yeah. We're back. Um, we're so back. And speaking of being back, we are back talking about props.cash because these guys are the best. And this episode was brought to you by props.cash. Make sure you sign up for that first month for 25% off with code Delara25 and be able to lock in these props on these crazy days, uh, these massive NBA slates coming up. I think the season is going to be really be looking at big Mondays, big Wednesdays, big Saturdays, especially uh, coming out of the gate. So it's going to be a great opportunity, especially with football starting to wind down, for you guys to be able to study your own props, help me help you, help me help you get these props, and let's continue to cash that on props.cash with code Delara25. And producer Corey, it's a hell of a time. Tis the season. Let's cash that. Pillsbury cookie.